Welcome to the farm. On August 25th, the Supreme Court found all coal block allocations made for a two-decade period starting 1993 arbitrary and illegal. On September 24th, in the second part of its decision, the court decided that the consequence of these illegalities is deallocation or cancellation of all blocks involved. The cancellations are effective March 31st, 2015, giving the government and government-owned Coal India enough time to take over the operation of the blocks. The Supreme Court has also imposed a penalty of 295 rupees per metric ton on all the coal extracted from the blocks so far. Quite obviously, the order is a difficult one to swallow for all the affected companies, more so for the 46 entities who have operationalized the mines or are very close to doing so. Some of them, such as Nalco and Jaiswal Neko, are keen to seek a review of the deallocation itself. Others, such as JSPL, want the penalty amount reviewed. Will any of these review petitions find success? Well, to answer those questions, I'm joined today by well-known constitutional expert P.P. Rao and Supreme Court Senior Counsel Gopal Jain. Gentlemen, to both of you, a very warm welcome. Mr. Rao, Justice Krishna Iyer in 1980 said that unless the first judicial view is manifestly distorted, a plea of review is likely asking for the moon. Review petitions very rarely succeed. In this situation, do you think any of the affected parties are likely to find success if they were to file a review petition? What grounds on which could they find success? See, unless we see the review petition and the grounds formulated by them, it is difficult to comment about the rate of success. Mm -hmm. But however, as general proposition, the review petitions rarely succeed. And why? The reason is this, the grounds of review are very limited. One ground which is commonly invoked is, there is some error or mistake apparent on the face of the record in the judgment which has been given. And that means there is something which stares you in the eye, that there is something wrong on the face of it. I find it very difficult to say that on the face of it, there is something is wrong with the judgment. It is judgment which, to I, which I consider a well-considered judgment. They have gone through the entire record and they came to the conclusion that the procedure followed is arbitrary and there has not been proper application of the proper uh, rules and principles. And uh, this is a matter of granting larges to the, uh, of, the, of the public uh, property. And therefore, the, both the various methods followed, uh, the screening method and also the government dispensation method and the administrative dispensation method all three are found to be wrong. So it seems to be a conscious application of mind to the facts of the case and the findings have been recorded. It is only when we see the formulations made by the petitioners who want to seek review, then we can reassess the position as to how far these grounds will stand. So far as the question of the, 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 the amount which is stipulated by the court that they should pay per metric ton, 295 rupees, etc., that also the court has said that they don't have accurate data, but they are going by the report estimate made by the CAG, and therefore they, they said that under the circumstances we had to make some guess, 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 guess make a guess of it, and they uh, reasonably they came to the conclusion that this is the amount. Probably they are able to demonstrate that this calculation of 295 is palpably wrong, and maybe the court may be inclined to review that part of it. That is my view. All right, sir. You've raised both grounds on which petitioners are likely to file review. One is against the actual deallocation itself, and some other petitioners, such as JSPL, have suggested that they would like to file a review petition against the amount of penalty imposed. I will try and place arguments on both grounds, but before that, Gopal Jain, if you were representing any of the affected parties, would you see enough grounds for a review petition to succeed? When a review petition is normally filed, uh, the grounds being limited and the court has having considered all these aspects, the likelihood is very, you know, slim. But having said that, I think that one very important aspect is the larger public interest aspect, which is that many of these companies having made significant investments are very close to operationalizing the end use, as well as the fact that core sectors like power and steel have a cascading effect on the entire economy. And therefore, overriding public interest should have been a ground which the court could have considered in molding the relief. 
But Gopal, if I may interrupt you, these are arguments made by uh, several of the senior counsel representing the affected parties, Mr. Venu Gopal, Harish Salve, uh, Abhishek Manu Singhvi. And these are arguments that the Supreme Court bench did consider and yet decided to deallocate en masse. So uh, would making these arguments again through a review petition uh, you know, hold any water? No. I, I, le OK, let, let me take a step back. The letter of allocation is the crucial document on which the whole case hinged. Now, letters of allocation were issued, which is like a bankable document on which, you know, banks, etc., lent several thousand crores to various of these core sectors. These were implemented and acted upon. And eventually, the court found that this letter of allocation had no legal value at all. Now, this, according to me, could fall within the considerations of an error apparent because this was the very basis which was acted upon by people making investments, by end-use industries, those developing the block. And several times, government said to several of the allocators, look, if you don't comply with these conditions, we will be forced to deallocate, which they did in some cases. So the substratum of the whole case hinged on the legality and validity of the letter of allocation, which, in, in my view, was a bankable document. And that really goes to the root of the matter. Second, the point I was trying to make is the impact and consequences may have considered, but I think the consideration did not take the larger focus into account and the effect and merely going by the government's assurance that we would be able to handle the situation is like saying if there's a storm or a blast, let it come, we will be good at rehabilitation. The idea is, could it have been prevented? Could they have offered a right of first refusal saying whatever is the auction determined price or Gopal, the market why price, should, if why people were to match it, court? Why should the Supreme Court step into determining or designing uh, what the reallocation process should be? That clearly falls within the ambit of the executive. And the Supreme Court, you know, wouldn't you say, has done the right thing by staying away from trying to design a reallocation policy and adding controversy to the current situation. Let me get a view from Mr. P.P. Rao on what he thinks of your suggestion of error apparent being suitable grounds for review petition. Mr. Rao, uh, several of the senior counsel that represented the affected parties did put in big numbers out there in terms of the impact, right? Uh, so it would be, you know, investments to the tune of 4 lakh crore rupees would be impacted, 28,000 megawatts of power capacity will be affected, uh, estimated loss of 4.4 lakh crores in terms of royalty, cess, direct and indirect taxes, uh, bank loans will be impacted. The Supreme Court heard all of this and yet decided to deallocate the blocks. Would you then agree with Gopal that this might still serve as grounds for review? You're absolutely right. The Supreme Court has listed out all the possible consequences mentioned by Mr. Venugopal and other counsel who appeared in the matter and applied mind to those consequences. And still it came to the conclusion that the process of allocation was arbitrary and cannot be sustained. And only in a few cases they have allowed the blocks to the allocation to continue. In the case of public undertakings, we did not have joint venture. The concept of an error apparent in the face of the record needs to be understood clearly. The Supreme Court in various decisions said you should be able to point out there in a few minutes. It is not a question of re-arguing the whole matter on the grounds which were already urged but not accepted by the court. So that rehearing is not what is contemplated by review. But that kind of an error apparent in the face of the record is difficult to find out in this case. That's what I feel. Uh, so I just want to add to, you know, one other argument that several critics of this decision have been making, which is, uh, you know, whether the Supreme Court ignored the principles of natural justice in not granting each individual affected party a hearing when determining the consequences. Now, the Supreme Court has, has, has discussed this in its order and said, look, we did listen to the large industry groups uh, and we did listen to the senior councils representing those groups. So in a sense, we've heard all the arguments, including the arguments of various state governments. Uh, yet, there are some companies who believe uh, that their specific circumstances regarding the allocation must be heard before they are penalized, either by way of deallocation or the monetary penalty. Would you think that grounds of natural justice might be one way a review petition would succeed, Mr. Rao? Even this aspect was considered by the court. Mm -hmm. And this was also raised before the court that all the individual companies were not issued notices and they did not have opportunity to present their cases. And the court has taken the view that all the interests were broadly represented before the court and what possible arguments have already been advanced before the court. So therefore, in this situation, there is also a line of decisions of the Supreme Court which say, if hearing each individual is not going to make any material change, 
that is a futile exercise and courts will not resort to futile exercise. That line of decisions are also there. So the whole question is, if any individual comes and says, look here, I have these X, Y, Z points which were not considered by the court, then that affected party could come forward before the court and point out those things, if they are going to make any material difference to the ultimate conclusion. But unless there is a concrete case like that, it is merely saying that opportunity is not given, which aspect which was already considered by the bench is not going to make any difference. But broadly the position is this. It is very difficult to say that in the face of it, the judgment is wrong. Because judgment has considered all aspects. A judgment may be right or wrong. Two views may be possible. Maybe court has taken one view, while another view is also possible. But that's not a ground for review. Okay, Gopal, we've discussed many legal technical grounds for review. Uh, let me come up with one uh, argument, you know, that's been raging uh, with many of the affected parties that I've spoken to, and that is that what fault of ours in this entire process that we are being punished, right? The allocations were made by screening committees set up by successive governments over a two-decade period. Companies believed they had grounds for asking for a coal block allocation and that when they got it, they did not actually sit in judgment of the process through which they got it because they just assumed the government was working to a process that was well laid down. Uh, many of these companies are saying or drawing the distinction between the 2G decision and what has taken place in this decision in the 2G decision the Supreme Court bench very clearly found malified. In fact, it said that this arbitrary action of the Minister of Communications and IT appears to be innocuous, but was actually intended to benefit some of the real estate companies who did not have any experience in dealing with telecom services. But this coal decision makes no uh, suggestion of any malified. So companies are saying, if we haven't done anything wrong, why are we being punished? Yeah, Menka, this is where I think the first uh, issue that you raise of natural justice also becomes important. Okay. Apart from the fact that it's a basic feature of the constitution, the story of each allocatee was different. And if you were going to visit capital punishment, which is the extreme form of, ca which is deallocation or cancellation, it would have made sense to hear each person to give their side of the story to say what is it they've done with the block, what is the end use, what is the investment they've made, etc. That, that should have been considered. Second, the court could have said, all right, even if we felt the procedure was wrong, they shouldn't have been done. They could have made overruled it prospectively like they did in the arbitration case where they said after the date of the judgment, any arbitration agreement, the judgment would apply not prior to that. And third, yes, it is important in a case like this to say, they, instead of clubbing everybody and tarring them with the same brush, I think it would have been helpful to see those who were, who had used the blocks and those who had put it to an end use with investment should have been treated differently from those who had not worked the block at all or invested in it. So, yes, there is some merit in that version. But which will that other view succeed on a review petition, Gopal? I, no, I think in a, in a review petition, the chance is very slim or unlikely because the court did consider it. So it will be difficult to say it, is, it is an, falls within the error apparent test. All right, gentlemen, I'm going to take a quick break here. But when we come back, we'll talk about whether a petition that seeks to review the penalty amount of 295 rupees per metric tons is likely to find any success or let's say more success than a review petition against the actual deallocation. That's up next. <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm going to bring to you some of the arguments made by some of the affected companies. For instance, the public sector company Nalco says that it will consider filing a review because it too should have been spared just as SAIL and NTPC were and they were spared on grounds of being uh, central government units and that was well within the allocation policy. So Nalco is asking the question as to why it was not spared and that's an important question it hopes to address through the review petition. Then you have a company, uh, you know, for instance, like Jess Walneko who says, look, how can you impose a penalty of 295 rupees on us uh, given that that coal that was mined from those blocks, you know, has already through various processes uh, been sold or consumed and now where are we going to recover that additional money from since this is a matter of several years back. You've got JSPL which says that that 295 rupees per metric ton is a figure arrived by the CAG uh, taking into account different kinds of coal mines but we actually work with a lower grade coal mine and therefore 295 rupees should not apply to us. Uh, would any of these grounds especially on the penalty 
front maybe have more success than actually fighting the full-scale deallocation, Gopal? Well, on the first point that you said about NALCO, uh, they're trying to make out a case for parity, saying that I'm also a public sector and should have been excluded. But again, whether it falls strictly within the error apparent test, possibly or possibly not, because it was a considered view taken by the court mm -hmm. to save these four blocks and not, not include NALCO. It was a good case to do before the judgment, but whether, again, it's a, a review, reviewable or not, in my view, would be difficult. Second, on the penalty aspect, it was the CAG recommendation was adapted and made as the benchmark or the yardstick. But again, it, the penalty has a civil and adverse consequence, and it should have been a case of hearing the affected parties. And the point that you said Nico Jaiswal made could have again been made and the court could have considered whether they should have been subjected to this penalty and this amount of penalty. So both aspects are there. One is the aspect of whether penalty should be imposed and be the aspect of the quantum of penalty. And the Supreme Court itself has said that being a coercive measure with an adverse consequence, even on a quantum a par per party is entitled to be heard. So nobody was heard on the aspect of quantum. It was a figure taken from the CAG recommendation and report, and it was imposed across the board. So you think that they might find success, some of these companies, if they were to argue through their review petitions uh, you know, for a lower quantum of penalty? I think, I think, again, unlikely because, like I said, the common threat through the court's judgment is cancel all blocks and put an, impose a penalty across the board. So that is the considered view of the court, and therefore I think it's unlikely that any of these points will really, uh, you know, uh, warrant any success in a review petition. Mr. Rao, you raised the issue of penalty right in your first response. I come back to it now. The Supreme Court acknowledged in its order that in matters of this nature, it is difficult to arrive at any mathematical acceptable figure quantifying the loss sustained. Do you believe that any of these companies, however justified their grounds are for a lower penalty, will succeed in arguing for a lower penalty through a review petition? If they're able to demonstrate by facts and figures that the estimate given by the CAG is obviously wrong, then there may be a chance. But that's a Herculean task. And now in retrospect, you also appreciate in the 2G spectrum, the court was guided by CAG's estimate, estimate of loss, but which has turned out to be, after subsequent auctions, etc., was a very highly inflated figure. So therefore, CAG also cannot be taken as, uh, as the figure as sacrosanct or absolutely authentic. It is just an estimate. If it is shown, if it is demonstrated to the court in the review petition that the estimate is obviously wrong, then maybe there is a chance the court will consider that aspect. I don't rule out the possibility, but of course, it is very unlikely that a review petition will succeed. Uh, you know, given the slim chances that it will succeed, let me add to the odds, sir, and that is that, you know, several companies might have different takes. For instance, JSPL says the penalty amount actually refers to coal of grade ABC. We are mining coal of grade EF. Some other company may have the issue, like Jaiswal Neko pointed out, saying, look, we've already consumed this coal. Where are we going to recover the additional 295 uh, rupees from? A third company may have a third argument for a third amount that should be imposed on them. So is you know, in a review petition, will the review bench that listens to this, uh, sans the outgoing CJI, will they be able to say, okay, well, your argument calls for 290 rupees and somebody else's argument calls for 250 rupees and a third party's argument calls for 150 rupees and hence allocate different penalties based on different review petition arguments? Well, that would be very difficult. That would be very difficult. It's very unlikely. So how will they and go the about it, sir? the outgoing... Yes, and uh, the fact that the outgoing Chief Justice has uh, already retired uh, means only this much. There's another judge will be added to the bench now in his place. No, that's fine, sir, so but it, it could very I... well be that the review bench will have to listen to 40 arguments because there are 40 operational minds and therefore 40 entities that will dispute the penalty amount. Uh, are they going to be able to do that? Is that realistic? Is that what takes place in a review? And therefore, would you say that these are not slim chances for a review? These are zero chances for a review of the penalty amount? If at all the, the bench is impressed with uh, any of the facts and figures given by them to disputing the amount of 295 from FHE, mm -hmm. they may have a limited hearing to clarify the position further 
and may issue some further directions that might have clarification but that that's all one can expect at the most but not that it will happen but generally as i said it's very difficult to make out a case to show that this estimate is wrong because this was estimate given by this eag it was on record before the court everybody knew what it was the government endorsed this figure as well because uh, the attorney general mukul rohadgi in fact in his submission to the court said that the court must apply a penalty of 295 rupees retrospectively at that gopal should i then take away from this conversation with mr rao and you that the chances of any review succeeding whether on grounds of deallocation or the penalty itself are absolutely zero Yes, it's it's very it's very slim, uh, Menka. The chances of a of a review succeeding in a case like this, because as we've just discussed, all these arguments were made, and rightly or wrongly, the court rejected them and said. The, the block should be deallocated and a penalty should be put all right that brings me to my final question to both you gentlemen gopal i'll put it first to you uh, in all of this the erring ministers and the bureaucrats which for over two decades occupied the screening committee assisted the screening committee uh, and allowed for this processless allocation to take place or this arbitrary series of allocations to take place have escaped unaffected and instead it is the companies who may have very well applied in good faith who are now going to bear not just some brunt of this order but the full brunt of this order retrospectively you know uh, what would you say about the justice that this order has delivered no i think uh, menika you raised a very important point of accountability of those who took decisions if they had taken decisions which were arbitrary or wrong then squarely the blame slash punishment slash liability should have been on them as you said this has basically clubbed all the allocators together and given if i may use the word like a mass punishment and if you remember years ago when petrol pumps had been cancelled on block the supreme court itself reversed it and said no you can't have a on block cancellation you should hear each case and then decide so in a sense these people have got those who took these decisions have at the moment uh, gotten away scot free and that doesn't send the right signal because they should be held accountable for their decisions and it should not be that only the allocators themselves uh, were to blame because the procedure and the policy was framed by the government and they were beneficiaries of that but they certainly were not the authors or the architects of that the persons who had taken part in the process of processing these applications or in helping these allocations they were not individually made parties before the court there was a relief sought against them individually the prescription was only fo only focused on the legality of the allocations and that the court has decided if individuals had to proceed against and they had to be punished then they have to have been made parties to the court and proper allegations should have been made against them and they should have had an opportunity to reply to them and only then the court could have taken action against them in this proceeding which has been decided now by the court that issue could not have been gone into within the parameters of law all right gentlemen i appreciate you joining us today uh, and explaining uh, what the chances of any review petition are which as of this discussion seem to be very slim close to zero mr rao gopal jain thank you very much for sharing your thoughts with us on the farm with that we're going to wrap up this edition right here thanks very much for watching